lovely to see everybody this morning. Uh, and hello to everybody out in Zoom land. Uh, I'm very excited about this morning's talk. Uh, my name is Rebecca Muley, and I'm one of the incoming Grand Rounds Committee co-chairs, I guess no longer incoming, but current, uh, along with Drs. Adi Talati and Alexander Harris. Welcome to today's Grand Rounds. We have a few announcements. Uh, next week's Grand Rounds presentation will be on Wednesday, January 31st, and will be a clinical update on psychopharmacology for mood disorders. It will be presented by Professor James Murrow, MD, PhD, the Vice Chair for Clinical Research and the Director of the Depression and Anxiety Center for Discovery and Treatment in the Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at Mount Sinai. His talk will be titled Advances in Biological Therapies for Treatment-Resistant Depression. Um, I'd also like to encourage everyone joining us remotely to post questions at any time during the talks using the Q&A feature, not the chat function, at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, if you're a trainee, please put the word trainee in your question, um, and also let us know if you would like to ask the question yourself. We can make you a panelist, and then you can ask fully come up on the screen in the auditorium to ask your question. Uh, we would love to have trainees both remotely and in the audience uh, participate, and so we will definitely hold a few questions for our trainees um, during our Q&A session. Um, please uh, also add your name and uh, the department you are sitting in as you ask your question so that we can all enhance our sense of community here and get to know each other. Uh, today's Grand Rounds will showcase a true example of translational neuroscience, a star of our sister university, Weill Cornell Medicine, Dr. Connor Liston. Dr. Liston is a professor of neuroscience and psychiatry. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College in 2002 and received his PhD from Rockefeller University in 2007 and his MD from Weill Cornell in 2008. He completed his residency in psychiatry at New York Presbyterian and his postdoctoral training at Stanford University. He then returned to Weill Cornell as an assistant professor in 2014. So those doing the math can see how quickly he's progressed to professor. Uh, his research has been recognized by numerous foundations and organizations, among them the Hope for Depression Research Foundation and the Eva King Killam Award from ACNP. He's been funded numerous times by the NIH with four current R01 awards, amongst others. The long-term goals of his research program are to define basic mechanisms through which prefrontal cortical brain circuits support learning, memory, and motivation, and to understand how these functions are disrupted in depression, OCD, and other neuropsychiatric disorders. His team is also, and very excitingly, developing neuroimaging techniques for informing psychiatric diagnosis in human populations to aid in the prediction of treatment response to neuromodulation techniques. He is also a clinically active psychiatrist who specializes in the management of treatment-resistant mood disorders. Uh, his talk is entitled Probing and Rescuing Dysfunctional Brain Circuits in Depression. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Liston. All right, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for that generous introduction and for inviting me here. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, it's nice to reconnect with lots of friends up at Columbia. Um, so uh, before I jump in, I just wanna uh, clarify some disclosures. I've been a scientific advisor to Compass Pathways, Delic Therapeutics, Brainify.ai, and uh, Janssen Neuroscience, um, but I won't be discussing any work related to uh, my role as an advisor to any of those organizations today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a series of studies uh, in mouse models uh, and in human patients with depression um, aimed at understanding the mechanisms that uh, regulate and drive mood state transitions. So we know um, uh, that depression is this, by definition, fundamentally episodic condition. It's defined by these periods of low mood interposed between periods of wellness um, but I, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that um, our, our understanding of the mechanisms that control those transitions uh, over time is still pretty rudimentary. Much of the work that's uh, happened in the field of uh, depression research in actual patients, um, but also in kind of preclinical stress models in rodents, tends to take a cross-sectional approach, comparing a group of you know, depressed individuals with a group of never depressed healthy controls, uh, or um, something analogous in, in mice uh, or rats. We've learned a lot from that work. I'll be touching on some of those discoveries as, as we go. Uh, but in order to get a sense of, uh, of answers to questions like, 
uh, why does a person get depressed today as opposed to last week or next month? And, and when they get depressed, what determines how long they stay depressed? Why do some of us you know, get depressed uh, for just a few weeks, others for months or years? Then conversely, when someone uh, is treated and gets better, what are the mechanisms that initiate that recovery? And are there other mechanisms perhaps that are responsible for sustaining that um, over time? And uh, in order to get at questions like that, we really need a longitudinal approach. And uh, that's what a lot of the work I'll be describing today um, has attempted to do. Um, we also try to uh, tackle this question um, through a lens of understanding uh, that uh, you know, depression is a, a heterogeneous condition, that not all patients with depression necessarily have the same mechanisms uh, driving their symptoms. Um, and you can see a beautiful example of that um, in this slide, which I have um, borrowed from uh, Robert Post and colleagues. This is published over 20 years ago now. Um, I know of uh, very few examples like this um, where they tracked um, individuals and just described what they saw um, in the changes in their mood states over time. And you can see here, um, uh, periods of depressed mood uh, are reflected in kind of negative values in this graph. Um, uh, above the x-axis is hypomania or mania, and zero is kind of normal euthymic mood. And you can learn a lot just by kind of studying these, by, by, but, but at a glance, you can see that these three individuals um, have very different temporal dynamics to their mood states. Um, the first one seems to have kind of characteristic lengths to their depressive episodes, at least for a time. Um, and these are longer than the episodes observed in this second individual who tends to flip back and forth pretty quickly. Um, uh, on the other hand, the second individual doesn't have um, periods of prolonged normal euthymic mood that are, that are quite as long as this first one or this third one. And Post and colleagues identified still other examples in other individuals. Um, and so we're really under, interested in understanding what are the mechanisms that control those, those mood state transitions. And, and to tackle this, we use um, uh, repeated uh, two-photon imaging in animals um, and repeated uh, fMRI assessments um, in humans. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we've learned so far. Um, undoubtedly, many mechanisms are involved, uh, but we've known now for uh, quite some time that uh, one of them might involve the remodeling of these structures called postsynaptic dendritic spines, which you can think of as structural markers of synapses. Most spines, these microscopic protrusions from the dendrites of, of neurons of uh, brain cells, uh, contain uh, synapses. Not all spines contain synapses. Happy to discuss kind of the the, the how those things are subtly different if people are curious. Um, but uh, for for today, I'll be using those terms kind of interchangeably: spines and synapses. And we've known for a while that chronic stress models tend to uh, decrease synapse density in the prefrontal cortex. There's also some evidence now that. There's a loss of synapses uh, in depressed patients in, in post-mortem studies. And we've known that antidepressants like ketamine tend to do the opposite, increasing the density of, of synapses in the prefrontal cortex. And so it's been tempting to speculate that these things could be causally involved in uh, driving um, mood state switches. Um, but it's also plausible that, uh, that, that they might just be correlated with some third factor that's actually mechanistically important. And getting to the bottom of that is more than just an academic kind of interesting question. Uh, it's also practically significant. I think that's probably obvious to people in this room. If you think that synapse formation is driving uh, antidepressant effects, then other interventions aimed at boosting synapse formation might be, might be useful um, as antidepressant targets. Uh, and so we really wanted to get a better handle on this. The first set of studies I'm going to describe were uh, led by Rachel Modasava, um, a grad student who's now at Harvard, Mitch Murdoch, who's now at MIT, and uh, Pooja Parekh, uh, an amazing postdoc now instructor in the lab who will, who's, who's on the job market, actually. Um, Pooja's uh, done some really cool work, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. Um, they set out to ask these three questions. Um, does ketamine, a rapidly acting antidepressant, does it selectively rescue stress-related synapse loss in the prefrontal cortex? Second, how does uh, synaptic remodeling influence circuit function and behavior? And third, uh, what is the causal relationship between these, these variables? Um, and, and, and I won't kind of bury the lead. I'll tell you right up front. We found that the formation of new synapses after ketamine treatment was causally important in, in controlling that mood state switch, uh, but not in the way we expected. I'm going to kind of unpack exactly what we learned uh, over the next few minutes. 
Um, before I jump into the data, I just want to orient you to the kinds of studies that we're that we're doing here, the methods we're using. So we're uh, we began by using two photon imaging to uh, visualize and quantify the remodeling of spines and synapses in the prefrontal cortex in the living brain longitudinally. To do that, we implant a microprism. Uh, into the contralateral hemisphere of the prefrontal cortex in mice. Um, this approach affords some nice uh, advantages. Uh, first, um, we're imaging along an optical path that's reflected off the hypotenuse of this prism. And that means that although we're doing some damage to the prefrontal cortex uh, in the hemisphere in which the prism is implanted, the hemisphere that we're imaging from is relatively structurally intact. And then another advantage is we get a lot of light in and out of, of, of this prism. Um, it, it, using uh, vascular landmarks uh, and the contours of the prism, we can return again and again to the uh, exact same position. And because um, we're able to capture, um, uh, as I said, a lot of light coming out of the prism, um, we're able to obtain these fairly high resolution images um, and, and return to the same spines and synapses with, with micrometer precision. And, and we began by asking um, what impact uh, chronic stress models. Um, I can describe the different models we looked at if that's of interest. What int what impact these different chronic stress models had on spine remodeling, uh, which we quantified by um, identifying eliminated spines, which were which were those like these arrows here, which are uh, present uh, in the first image uh, but not in the second, um, or uh, formed spines, um, which like those uh, denoted by these arrowheads are present in the second image but not in the first. Uh, and the first thing uh, Rachel and Mitch discovered um, was uh, kind of predictable based on what I just told you from fixed tissue studies. They found that uh, in this chronic court model of the neuroendocrine response to chronic stress, that there was uh, a, a big increase in spine elimination. But because they're doing this in vivo, they, begin, they can begin to ask more targeted questions about whether there's a logic to which spines are being lost. Um, and one way you can get at that um, uh, is based on uh, others' work, which has indicated that one of the functions of dendritic branching in these nerve cells is to segregate functionally homogeneous synaptic inputs. In other words, inputs coming from region A will tend to synapse on branch one, but not branch two, whereas inputs coming from region B will tend to synapse on branch two, but not branch one. And so if you, if you think that particular projections are being targeted for pruning, what you might predict is that some branch segments would show a lot of elimination and others would not. And that's exactly what they observed. A strong bimodal distribution of spine elimination across, across branch segments, most exhibited spine loss rates comparable to controls, but about 40% exhibited markedly elevated spine loss rates, sometimes up to tenfold the normal number in controls. Um, not shown here, they also found that lost spines tended to be spatially clustered. Um, they tended to occur together in kind of bunches um, uh, on, on, on a given branch segment. They next uh, shifted uh, in the same mice to asking what effects uh, ketamine um, had on spine elimination and spine formation. Again, we're imaging before and after chronic stress, treating mice with ketamine or a vehicle control injection, and then imaging one day later when we know that many patients who get treated with ketamine show a strong antidepressant effect. Uh, and uh, Mitch, uh, Pooja, and Rachel found that uh, ketamine had this strong effect on spine formation, and uh, it was also uh, bimodally distributed, uh, selectively affecting um, a smaller number of, of particular dendritic branch segments and, and spatially clustered, suggesting perhaps that ketamine is acting in kind of a targeted way to undo the effects of stress. Um, and, and to really test that directly, uh, we, we then asked whether there was evidence that uh, the spines that formed after ketamine treatment were actually um, restoring synapses that were lost during stress uh, in a selective way. And to do that, uh, they categorized each spine that formed after ketamine treatment as a restored spine, if like this uh, one denoted by this blue arrowhead here, um, if it formed in a position where a spine used to exist and then disappeared, or a de novo form spine, if like this purple one, it formed in a position where we didn't observe a spine in either of the previous two images. And what they found was strong evidence for a lot of spine restoration um, after ketamine treatment. Many of those spines are kind of sprouting up uh, in the exact same position that they used to live in um, before, uh, before the chronic stress exposure, much more than you'd expect by chance based on the observed rate of spine formation. 
Um, that's kind of the glass half full view of these data. I also want to emphasize the glass half empty view because it's um, going to be relevant later. Um, if you look at this, um, this is telling us that about half of the spines that form after ketamine treatment are restored spines, which is really pretty remarkable. Again, uh, much more than you'd expect by chance. Um, but you should also recognize that about half of them aren't restored spines. They're de novo form spines. And doing some quick math based on the observed rates of spine loss and spine formation, what we, what we know is that although many spines are coming back in the same position, and the animals, which I haven't shown you yet, um, are behaviorally normal. They look like they their stress effects have been reversed. The spine configuration is not normal. Um, some spines have come have come back, but many have not come back. And we think that might be relevant for the reemergence of uh, of stress related behaviors uh, later. And I'm and I'm going to show how that might work uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, come back to that. Uh, shifting gears, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the functional correlates of, of these changes. So uh, here we're doing the exact same experiment I just described, except instead of imaging structural markers of synapses, we're imaging uh, neuronal function using a genetically encoded calcium sensor, GKEMP6. Um, and uh, these cells have been you know, engineered to fluoresce when they become active. Um, and uh, using algorithms others have developed, we can segment these images into individual neurons, and uh, we can ask many questions about the functional properties of these cells. The most basic one you might imagine asking, um, if chronic stress is associated with a lot of synapse loss and ketamine is restoring those synapses, you might predict that the structure of correlated activity um, in this microcircuit might change, that functional connectivity between these cells might be altered. Um, this analysis is actually much the same um, as what uh, neuroimaging researchers do with um, functional connectivity in fMRI data, just at a different scale. And I'll sort of illustrate that in a couple of minutes too. Um, and, and that's exactly what they found. And that's illustrated uh, in a couple of different ways in this uh, representative example from a single mouse. Um, uh, the bottom row here depicts uh, correlation matrices um, where warm elements in the matrix depict pairs of cells that are strongly functionally coupled and cool elements depict cells that you know aren't really functionally coupled. And again, you don't really need fancy statistics. You can just see by glancing at this, there's a lot of a, a loss of warm colors um, after after chronic court treatment in these mice. Um, the other way of uh, visualizing this, um, we didn't necessarily anticipate, but it just sort of stood out at us when we plotted the data in, in the, the raster plots you see in the top row. We found that, um, and just to orient you, um, in these raster plots, left to right is time, each row is a cell, and the elements are colored by how active the cell is at a given time. And what you can see is that a lot of the activity that happens uh, at baseline it, it occurs in the context of these multi-cell ensemble events where many or even most cells in the field of view become active at about the same time. And after chronic court treatment, the occurrence of these ensemble events is reduced in frequency. And when they occur, they tend to involve fewer cells. And we find that ketamine rescues both of those effects. Um, that's one mouse. We see this very consistently always in every mouse we looked at. I don't have uh, slides showing you that, but happy to talk about it if you're interested. Um, Next, we turn to asking whether these functional changes are behaviorally relevant. And we've done that in a bunch of different ways. I don't have time to illustrate all of them. Um, I, I want to highlight, in particular, um, Tim Spellman's work looking at cognitive flexibility and the role of these prefrontal ensembles in, in supporting that behavior. Um, Tim is uh, a, a former grad student uh, here at Columbia, did his postdoc with me, now has his own lab at the University of Connecticut. Uh, as well as uh, Rob Fetcho's work at, with, with Bela Hall and David Estrogen, Estrin on uh, social hierarchy perception. Um, and, and I'll briefly show you uh, these two examples um, uh, looking at the role of these ensembles. Um, this is actually in press now at Neuron. Um, uh, 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 the role of these ensembles in supporting uh, motivated reward seeking behavior and, and motivated escape behavior in response to threats. Um, uh, this is Rob's work. Um, this is actually out. You can see this online if you're interested. It, it, it just got published, as I said, in Neuron. Um, Rob, and, and I'm just going to kind of summarize at a high level um, to save plenty of time for questions. Um, Rob was interested in the role of the medial prefrontal cortex in supporting uh, effortful reward seeking. Um, uh, decisions that we all make on a, a daily basis about um, when to expend effort in order to obtain rewards versus uh, foregoing an effort expenditure in favor of a better opportunity later. 
Um, and Rob uh, designed a task which he basically adapted um, from uh, a, 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 a well-known task paradigm in rats. He adapted it for use in mouse in mice and, and automated it uh, to make it uh, automatic and compatible with um, photometry and anoptogenetics. Um, in this task, mice learn to navigate left or right to obtain uh, a large reward or a small reward. And in order to obtain the large reward, they need to climb over a physical barrier. Um, and we can uh, titrate the ratio of the large reward to the small reward and the size of the barrier to look at individual differences in um, how much effort a given mouse is willing to expend in order to obtain how big of a reward. Um, and uh, summarizing, uh, I'm going to skip this, a lot of work um, that Rob did recording from uh, these cells in the anterior cingulate that project to the nucleus accumbens. Rob found that these neurons um, encode a signal that anticipates the receipt of a future reward. So you can see there's a strong signal time locked to reward acquisition, and it actually begins to increase before the mouse gets the reward. Uh, and that signal scales with the amount of effort that it's required to obtain the reward. Um, interestingly, if you optogenetically silence these cells during the task, uh, during different epochs of the task, Rob found that uh, this circuit seems to play a role in reinforcing future decisions to expend effort to obtain rewards. Um, so if you optogenetically silence the cells after the mouse has already made its decision and expended the effort, um, what you get is a reduced tendency to choose the high effort, high reward option on future trials. Interestingly, if you optogenetically silence it before the mouse has made the decision, I'm not showing you that, but it's in the paper, he doesn't see any effect. Um, so we think that these cells are particularly important for uh, encoding information and integrating information, both about effort expenditures and rewards and reinforcing future decisions to, to uh, go for the high effort, high reward option. And in the chronic court model that I described, we, we see a, a, a dramatic decrease in the mouse's tendency to choose the high effort, high reward option from like 90% down to less than 20%. Um, and, and in accord with that, we see a kind of uh, disruption of this signal. Um, uh, that, that's, that signal disruption is even greater um, in the mice with the larger deficits in effortful reward seeking. Um, we're currently looking at whether antidepressants like ketamine um, act to reverse those effects and, and how that might work. But what we think this tells us is this is one way in which these medial prefrontal ensembles might be important for depression-related behavior in uh, regulating uh, motivation and effortful reward seeking. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in, in, in humans uh, kind of a parallel to this uh, at the end. Um, we also looked at another kind of behavior, motivated escape behavior uh, in the, the tail suspension test. This is motivated by work from uh, Melissa Warden um, showing that, uh, that medial prefrontal neurons that project to the serotonergic dorsal raphe nucleus, if you optogenetically activate them, you will um, alter uh, an animal's tendency to respond to a threat um, and bias the animal towards responding with like active avoidance, like escape behavior. Um, in tests like the four swim test and the tail suspension test, we, we, we know that animals spontaneously alternate between um, immobility, um, kind of um, passive freezing um, in response to a threat versus uh, struggling to escape. Um, this test has been interpreted in lots of different ways. I, I prefer like not to um, over interpret it beyond like just what we're observing, which is that, uh, which is just what I described. The, the animals um, tend to alternate between these two behaviors, both of which may be adaptive in different contexts. Um, and uh, antidepressants uh, tend to favor the active avoidance um, uh, response, whereas uh, chronic stress models tend to increase the immobility response. Um, and what Rachel um, and Mitch found recording from cells in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, uh, during the tail suspension task um, is that uh, there's this signal, um, which you see here, um, pink bands denote periods of struggling, white bands denote periods of immobility. Um, and this signal is quite correlated with the mouse's tendency to struggle, um, but that might be related in a kind of uninteresting, non-specific way to locomotor activity, um, this being kind of adjacent to premotor cortex in mice. Um, and so they focused instead on another observation, which is that the increase in activity in this circuit tends to precede and predict switches from immobility to struggling behavior. 
and not shown here. I'll just describe briefly. They found that chronic stress, uh, again, I showed you, reduces these ensemble events. That means there's, on average, a longer period of time before one occurs um, uh, during a period of uh, immobility. And uh, on average, they uh, struggle less, um, switch to struggling less frequently, and remain immobile for longer periods of time. And ketamine rescues all of those effects. Um, and so, again, this is kind of um, correlational evidence that the changes on, in ensemble activity that I showed you um, may be behaviorally relevant for depression. Um, before I switch to the, the um, actual work in patients, um, I want to uh, uh, close by uh, the animal section by addressing that critical question I posed at the beginning, which is how are all of these things uh, causally related? Um, I've shown you correlated changes in behavior, in spine formation, and in uh, circuit function, um, but we don't know um, what is cause and what is effect. Um, and so to get at that, we, we uh, ask this question in two different ways. Um, one is kind of brute force, but easy to follow, I think, logically. Um, if you think A causes B, A should come before B. And if instead A comes after B, that tells you something about cause and effect. Um, so just getting a handle on the temporal sequence of these events could be quite informative. Uh, and so in this series of studies, we imaged mice before and after chronic court treatment, and then repeatedly, um, many times in the hours to days up to a week after, after ketamine treatments, um, getting behavioral assessments, um, circuit function assessments, and spine formation assessments at these different time points to really characterize uh, the, the order of events here. Um, and what we found was not what we expected. Um, our hypothesis was that the formation of these synapses might be required for kind of triggering this switch. Um, but the data were very clear to us. Uh, the, uh, the, the change in immobility that occurs after ketamine treatment is very rapid, um, occurring within three hours. Um, uh, others actually have seen this too. Um, we, we, it, it's not common to look at that time point, but if we had dug into the literature a little more carefully, there are others who have done so and who have seen effects um, uh, very rapidly. We now think you, know, you, can, affect, you can observe those effects within minutes. Um, and uh, the effects on spines don't begin to emerge until about 12 hours after treatment, peaking 24 hours after treatment. So that tells you that at least in these cells we're studying, which are, if, you, if you're curious, thigh one expressing pyramidal neurons in mostly in layer five of the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, the formation of new spines in these cells couldn't be required for initiating the behavioral change because the behavior occurs first. Uh, and by the way, the changes in circuit function uh, parallel the changes uh, in behavior and precede the effects on spines. Um, in other words, we see this um, restoration of correlated activity and ensemble events just three hours after treatment, well before the emergence of new spines. Um, so uh, that caused us to take a step back and kind of rethink our model. And we wanted to address another possibility, which is that the formation of these new spines might be important not for initiating the switch, but perhaps for sustaining it over time. And one hint of that came from this scatter plot, which showed that the maintenance of restored spines was uh, highly correlated with the uh, maintenance over two days or one week of ketamine's antidepressant behavioral effects on immobility in this test. Um, and so we wanted to ask whether it might be the case, right, that uh, that deleting these spines would interfere with the uh, maintenance of those antidepressant behavioral effects. To do that, we teamed up with a group led by Haruo Kasai and Haruhiko Bito at the University of Tokyo. They developed an optogenetic tool, which they call uh, Activated Synapse Photoactivatable RAC1. The name, a bit of a mouthful, but the actual tool is very simple and elegant. Um, this is a blue light sensitive probe. Uh, whose expression is targeted to a sparse set of uh, newly uh, formed spines and recently potentiated synapses. And upon prolonged exposure to blue light, the probe changes conformation, initiating the RAC1 signaling cascade, and through interactions with the actin cytoskeleton, it causes um, spines expressing the probe to shrink and to collapse. And so you can selectively delete um, newly formed spines by shining blue light on them. Um, and Haru and Haruhiko used this tool to show that the formation of new spines in the forelimb area of motor cortex wasn't required for an, an learning a motor skill initially, but it was required for maintaining a memory of that motor skill over time. And so we wanted to be wanted to ask whether something similar might happen with ketamine. We treated mice with chronic court 
spines disappeared. We treated them with ketamine, restoring some of those spines. We photoactivated the probe 12 hours after treatment. You'll recall 12 hours is a time point when we see a lot of spine formation after ketamine treatment. Um, and we asked what impact that had on behavior. Um, this is just validation data showing that this intervention was sufficient to uh, disrupt the effects of ketamine on spine formation, as you see here. Um, and then this is the kind of key behavioral data. Shows you that chronic court, as expected, increases immobility of the tail suspension test. Ketamine reverses that effect. And if you photoactivate 12 hours after treatment and test two days or one week later, um, the effect uh, is wearing off. Um, and uh, we also have a negative control experiment, which I think is important. Um, here, we photoactivated three hours after treatment. And you'll recall that uh, three hours after treatment, there's no spine formation related to ketamine. Um, and so whatever spines we're deleting here have nothing to do with the ketamine treatment. Um, and we see that this has no impact on the behavior. So that tells us the spines are important and there's something especially important about the spines that form in the hours after ketamine treatment uh, for maintaining the antidepressant effects over time. Um, and I think for the clinicians in the room, it will be obvious why that's useful to know. Um, we, 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 anyone who treats patients with ketamine knows that a lot of people with treatment-resistant depression will get better after a single treatment of, with ketamine, but absent some other intervention, almost all those people will get depressed again um, within a week or two. And so you, you need to do something else to keep them well. And this suggests that other interventions aimed at boosting synapse formation might be useful, um, and we're trying to test that. Um, uh, we're also beginning to look at um, the mechanisms that are responsible for uh, initiating that switch if it's not synapse formation. Um, I'm happy to talk about it that, that at the end if people are curious, but in the interest of time, I kind of want to move on and talk a little bit about our human subjects research um, and save plenty of time for questions. Um, okay, I'm going to shift gears. Uh, so I've talked at the beginning about a, 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 an interesting kind of heterogeneity in depression, which is um, individual differences in, in, in the temporal dynamics of mood state switches. And I'm going to return to that uh, in a couple of minutes. But I want to um, begin by talking about another kind of heterogeneity, I think a kind that we think about more frequently with depression, which is that depression presents in different ways in different individuals with many different kinds of symptoms. We diagnose depression today when a patient presents with five or more of these nine symptoms, and that means there's at least 256 unique combinations of symptoms that meet these criteria. That's not even accounting for the fact that some of them contain opposites of themselves, like weight loss or weight gain, sleeping too much or sleeping too little. And so I think it's uh, intuitive and probably not controversial that someone who is sleeping four hours a night, intensely agitated and, and anxious, uh, lost 30 pounds, no appetite. Um, this person may not have the exact same biological problem as someone who's sleeping 20 hours a day, not agitated at all, just can't get out of bed, profoundly anhedonic, zero anxiety, uh, and gained 30 pounds. In many ways, the complaints that this person might have in your office, um, they're opposites of one another, and yet they get the same diagnosis um, and, and the same treatments. And again, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here probably, um, but I always like to say this, um, that uh, what I'm about to describe shouldn't um, dissuade people from seeking help for depression. In a way, it's miraculous that our treatments work as well as they do for these very different people. And they do work, right? They just don't work for everyone as well as we would like. Um, and so that's kind of what motivates this effort to rethink how we diagnose depression and account for individual differences. And of course, we're not the first to tackle this problem. Pioneering work dating back decades has uh, attempted to um, identify subtypes of depression, um, painting with very broad strokes, um, using an approach that generally tends to group people by the symptoms they present with, by their clinical presentation, and then ask whether those different subgroups are associated with different kinds of biological substrates, maybe biomarkers that could be useful for uh, making a diagnosis or uh, informing treatment selection decisions. Um, and, and, and whether those subtypes are associated with different treatment outcomes. Um, our work, um, and this is actually was, was initiated and led at first um, by Andrew Drysdale, who's now here at Columbia. Our work uh, sought to turn this upside down and ask whether we could group people by biology um, instead of by symptoms, and then ask whether those uh, subgroups defined by biology um, might be associated with different kinds of clinical outcomes, um, uh, different symptom profiles, different uh, treatment responses. 
the biological measure um, that we decided to focus on um, were uh, uh, these resting state fMRI measures of functional connectivity. Uh, th these, these assessments, which I think are familiar to a lot of folks here, um, are derived um, from, in part from the discovery by Bharat Biswal, Mark Rakel, and others about um, 20, 30 years ago now that uh, the brain at rest exhibits these spontaneous fluctuations in the bold signal, which you see depicted in this video, and regions of the brain that are strongly connected to one another uh, tend to fluctuate together. Uh, and you can measure that uh, functional connectivity, so to speak, by uh, characterizing the correlations in those bold signals across regions. We know now um, from a variety of like converging evidence from you know, anatomical tracers in, in primates, um, from uh, functional uh, and structural imaging in humans, from uh, diffusion tractography in humans. We know that areas of the brain that are synaptically connected uh, do tend to show correlated signals. I'm not, I hasten to emphasize here, um, uh, claiming that uh, these correlations are driven solely by monosynaptic connectivity. They're driven by many factors. But when I talk about functional connectivity today, we know that they're driven partly by synaptic connectivity, and this is what I'm referring to. Um, this first series of studies, uh, I just want to acknowledge Jonathan Downer, Faith Gunning, and Mark Dubin, collaborators at Cornell and Toronto, who, who made this work possible by uh, sharing data with me, as well as a, a host of others um, uh, pictured here who uh, made their data available to us um, and uh, often before it was published and this work wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, we began with a data set uh, of 711 subjects, um, including 333 unipolar depressed patients from five different sites, which we used for discovering the subtypes I'm about to describe uh, and for uh, training machine learning models, um, which you can think of as neuroimaging biomarkers for uh, diagnosing these subtypes and in individuals. And uh, for machine learning aficionados in the room, we know these methods are kind of notorious for overfitting to idiosyncrasies in the data that they're trained on. That's a topic I'm going to um, revisit in a moment. Um, and so it's really important to have a replication sample. And that's where this second data set came from. Um, so uh, again, before I jump into the results, um, I want to uh, kind of illustrate a little more the, the data that we're using. Um, so uh, we parcelate the brain um, using, we experimented with different functional parcellations. This particular one, which is the focus of, of Andrew Drysdale's um, work, uh, was uh, developed by Jonathan Power and Steve Peterson at Wash U. Um, Jonathan's now a colleague at, at Cornell and doing amazing work. Check out his work. Um, and we can extract a bold signal time series from each of these regions of interest and compute a correlation, like you see here, um, between pairs of regions. And we do that between each region and every other region. And that generates a matrix that looks like this. You'll see it uh, not completely unlike the functional connectivity matrices that I showed you in the mice earlier. Um, warm colors, again, denote pairs of regions that are strongly functionally coupled. This matrix contains uh, over... Um, 30,000 unique functional connectivity features, many of which, most of which presumably are not related to depression. And so if we were to try to cluster people on all of these symptoms, uh, sorry, all of these features, we might get clusters, but those clusters would probably be unrelated to depression. And so we needed a method to hone in on the features that are depression relevant, and ideally to represent them in a low dimensional space, which turns out to be important for technical reasons for obtaining good clustering. The method we settled on uh, is called canonical correlation analysis, which is analogous to uh, PCA. It searches for linear combinations of these connectivity features that, uh, that explain a lot of the variance, um, subject to the additional constraint that they should be correlated with linear combinations of clinical symptoms. So we're basically looking for a low dimensional representation of brain connectivity features that explain individual differences in symptoms. And what we found in this kind of data-driven approach was evidence of uh, two dimensions, one explaining individual differences in anhedonia and the other unrelated to anhedonia, but explaining individual differences in anxiety and insomnia. Um, I, I, I'd add here that, uh, and it should have been transparent to us when, when, when we published this, that um, there's overfitting in this model. Um, we, we did not intend to claim that 90% uh, of the variance in symptoms can be explained by fMRI signals, um, but that overfitting problem can be solved. I'll show you how, and I should also just hasten to add that uh, many others have used similar approaches for uh, it, it characterizing individual differences and, and grouping patients um, into subtypes um, based on neuroimaging and psychiatry. 
Um, the solution to this problem of overfitting basically involves two steps, which I'm um, happy to discuss in more detail, but I just want to at least highlight briefly. Um, the first is a stabilized bootstrap feature selection process, which um, basically results in a more stable focus on just a few features um, and adding uh, L2 regularization to the, the, the CCA model. Um, and what this shows you is that those two steps basically fix the problem. These blue violin plots are the first canonical correlation in training data, and the green violin plots are the first canonical correlation in held out test data. And you can see that they're uh, quite similar um, and that they begin to plateau around uh, the inclusion of about 100 uh, connectivity features. And again, this work, this work is published now some time ago. Uh, I'd also point you to work I don't have time to discuss, but uh, this was led by Katie Dunlap, who's uh, now running her own lab at the University of Toronto. She has actually like uh, replicated and extended these results in a much larger sample. Um, this is Impressive Biological Psychiatry. It's also available on BioArchive. Katie shows um, that there are um, stable and reproducible brain behavior dimensions um, that explain individual differences in in anhedonia, uh, and 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 then that second dimension can actually be broken down into two dimensions, um, uh, looking at uh, anhedonia, at anxiety, and at insomnia uh, separately. Um, and she went on to uh, uh, identify um, again um, subtypes in that space that have in interesting clinical um, symptom profiles and, and interesting differences in antidepressant response. Check out Katie's work, which I don't have time to describe in detail. Um, I, I also wanna highlight uh, Amanda Booch's work in autism, which recently came out in Nature Neuroscience, um, basically using a very similar approach um, and, and showing uh, robust um, detectable correlations in held out data. Um, uh, Amanda's done some great work to check out, check out her paper. Um, returning to uh, Andrew's paper, um, having identified those two dimensions, um, we then turn to looking for evidence of uh, subgroups within, within those dimensions. We found strong evidence of at least four clusters uh, in that 2D space. Um, obviously, uh, this doesn't look like single cell RNA sequencing data clusters. Um, they're not completely discrete clusters, um, but there is more clustering here than you'd expect by chance. And uh, the, what, what I want to try to persuade you of today is not that this is like the definitive answer to subtyping uh, in depression, but that this is one answer that uh, holds promise and um, has uh, clear value, which I'm about to show in terms of like predictive utility, um, and that the approach in general, I think, will be quite useful going forward. Um, so how do we think about like validating these subtypes? Um, so one way is, uh, is asking about how they differ with respect to connectivity measures and uh, clinical symptoms. Uh, and uh, these are uh, connectivity maps, he heat maps that, that depict um, abnormal connectivity in each of the four subtypes, warm colors uh, indicating connections that are strengthened in depression, cool colors connections that are weakened in depression. And again, uh, I think the, the main points here, we could dig into these, um, but you can just see by glancing at them that they look very different, that DSM assigns a single label to uh, these very different connectivity profiles and different subtypes of patients. And those subtypes are associated with different kinds of clinical symptoms. For example, subtype four has a lot of anxiety, uh, insomnia, and anhedonia. Subtype two is characterized more by low energy and fatigue. Um, the subtypes had differences in other symptoms as well, which we could delve into. Um, but I want to instead tell you a little bit about maybe the most important finding, which is that they differ with respect to treatment outcomes. You don't need an fMRI scan to diagnose depression, obviously, um, but choosing the right treatment is hard. Um, and, and having any kind of objective measure that might assist you um, could be uh, very impactful. And so to test that, uh, we were kind of motivated by this figure, um, which shows the neuroanatomical distribution of the abnormal connectivity features that varied by subtype. Um, and these nodes are scaled by how subtype specific they were. In other words, how different were they across the subtypes? And uh, one of the nodes that really stood out as among the most different was this area of the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, which happens to be a, a target for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so we teamed up with my, uh, my friend and collaborator at the University of Toronto, Jonathan Downer, who had a, a, a large retrospective neuroimaging data set of patients who got dorsomedial prefrontal TMS. Um, and we just asked uh, whether these patients would respond differently um, uh, by subtype. Um, and we already knew from others' work 
that functional connectivity seeded from the target site is at least modestly correlated with your likelihood of responding. And I think that kind of makes sense um, in a variety of ways if you think this, this treatment is working by stimulating a brain target and perhaps having downstream effects on a network, um, connectivity might be important. Um, and, and so uh, we tested that uh, retrospectively um, in Jonathan's data, and we found that they were, subtype one was very responsive, uh, subtypes two and four were not really at all responsive to this treatment, and subtype three showed sort of an intermediate level of responsiveness. Um, these differences were sufficient to train support vector machine classifiers, again, neuroimaging biomarkers for um, predicting responders and non-responders. Um, you can see that we get pretty good predictions just based on fMRI connectivity. We can improve that with including the subtype diagnosis. And we can also get statistically significant predictions with uh, just clinical symptoms, um, but not that different from chance, right? Like 60% is just a little better than 50%. Um, so probably not clinically meaningful. Um, the other thing I, I would add here is just an emphasis on how we interpret these data. This is leave one out cross-validation. Um, and the data that we're working with is fairly high quality. And so we don't think that these numbers necessarily reflect the accuracy rates you'd observe in a community sample deployed like at wide. Um, uh, what, we, what we think instead is that um, this is strong statistical evidence that there's a signal here um, and that this approach could be useful for predicting response. And, and we really need to test that prospectively. That's key. Um, and, and so we're doing that. Um, this, this work is inspired uh, by uh, work from, from Helen Mayberg and many others, um, but uh, I highlight Helen's work here published in, in the Green Journal in 2017. Helen showed that subgenual cingulate connectivity was associated with a differential likelihood of responding to CBT or to a psychopharm um, medication treatment um, for depression. Um, and that's important because what you would ideally want is not a biomarker that just tells you this person's gonna get better or not get better. That would be useful too. Um, but ideally you'd want a biomarker that helps you choose between two treatments. These are sick people. Typically the decision that you're faced with is uh, treatment A, B, or C, not to treat or not treat. Um, and so this kind of work we think is really important. Um, and, and we sort of uh, adapted the approach to focus on two different uh, brain targets for TMS, the dorsomedial prefrontal target, which I described earlier, and the more commonly used left dorsolateral prefrontal target. We now have a clinical trial underway in which um, patients are, uh, all, they all get a brain scan. Um, we formulate a prediction about which target we think will work better for them. And then we randomize them to get the, the, the treatment that we think will work better or not work as well. The good news for patients and, and clinicians is that uh, everyone gets an active treatment. There's no inactive treatment in this study. It's a, it's a, it's a prediction study. Um, and so uh, there's, you know, um, a lot of interest um, in participation among patients. If you think you might have a patient who would be a good candidate, please reach out. We're, we're constantly recruiting. And this is work in addition to Jonathan Faith. Um, this is work led by uh, Ben Zebley, the director of our interventional psychiatry program at Cornell, and in collaboration with Nolan Williams um, at Stanford, um, a multi-site study. Um, and we think this perspective kind of trial approach is really critical um, for obvious reasons and also for not obvious reasons. Obviously, we need to know how well the biomarkers perform prospectively before you'd ever think about using them to make decisions for patients. Um, but there are scenarios that I think are important to consider where even a very high performing biomarker might not actually be useful at all. Um, and that's illustrated in the scenario at the right here. This is obviously a schematic, not data. Um, this depicts a situation in which an individual's likelihood of responding to one target dorsolateral prefrontal is highly correlated with their likelihood of responding to the other target dorsomedial prefrontal. And you could substitute any treatments that you want there. Um, in that scenario, a biomarker is not gonna be useful um, because everyone's either gonna get better to both or not get better to either. Um, and you can just roll the dice and pick one and you're gonna get the same outcomes. The opposite scenario is kind of at the far left where everyone is a strong responder to one treatment, but not the other. And if you only knew which treatment to give in advance, you could get everyone better really quickly. Our modeling suggests that reality is something sort of in between. And these people in the upper left and lower right are the people we think we can really help, as well as to a lesser extent, the people in the lower left um, who might want to know that this treatment, neither of these treatments are likely to work for them and perhaps a third treatment should be considered. And so we're testing this. Um, we're about halfway done. We'll know in probably about two years. So um, hopefully I can uh, come back and update you then. Um, okay, doing good for time. The last couple of minutes, I'm gonna to return to that idea I brought up at the beginning about understanding um, 
individual differences in the mechanisms that drive mood state switches. Um, talked about a little in mice, and now I'm going to talk about it uh, a, a little more in human subjects. This work is enabled um, by uh, like some methods developments by uh, Chuck Lynch, um, published a couple of years ago. Chuck is a former postdoc who now has his own lab at Cornell. Chuck showed that um, multi-echo fMRI pulse sequences could be used to dramatically enhance the test-retest reliability um, of functional connectivity measures obtained from fMRI. Um, before I kind of unpack that for you, I just want to add, um, you know, we did not invent, needless to say, multi-echo um, fMRI. It's been around for a while, and, and others um, had kind of speculated that uh, it might have useful properties um, in this vein. And really what Chuck did was kind of systematically explore that and kind of tweak the sequence uh, to optimize for reliability. What you see here um, are data from the Midnight Scan Club at Wash U, where um, uh, people actually don't have time to go into it in detail. Um, it's an interesting study, check it out. This is led by Nico Dosenbach and others. Um, but they scan patients repeatedly um, and uh, they generated these big data sets for just uh, a small number of people. And that allowed us to look at, uh, and them as well, at uh, the reliability of these functional connectivity measures as a function of how much data is used to calculate them. And what you can see with warm colors denoting more reliability um, are kind of two patterns. There's more reliability with longer scans that had been seen before by many others. And also the, the reliability varies by brain region. Um, some areas are reasonably reliable with just five minutes of data, um, but others like the subgenial cingulates are not reliable at all, even with 30 minutes of data. Um, like this is basically noise, um, uh, just, just to emphasize that. Um, and so Chuck found that um, adding uh, multi-echo um, and multi-echo like pulse sequence acquisition um, with uh, ICA aroma um, noise um, removal um, improved uh, the uh, test for test reliability at every time point. Um, and, and then adding multi-echo denoising led to further improvements on top of that. And what you get um, is basically pretty reliable data, even with um, five or seven minutes um, that is better than basically the best case scenario you can get with single echo data. Um, and, uh, and with like 15 minutes of data, we're, we're pre getting pretty reliable measures from most places in the brain. Um, and, and so that's really critical for what I'm about to describe now. Our approach here in, in this study, looking at, uh, at kind of um, repeated assessments of individual patients as a cycle in and out of mood states was, was enabled by these more reliable measures, which will be important for obvious reasons, um, and also by uh, this approach uh, developed by folks at uh, Wash U, Harvard, Stanford, others, um, for uh, characterizing individual differences in the organization of these networks. I think of these individual differences by analogy to human faces. Uh, we all have two eyes and a nose and a mouth. And if you average that together, you get something that looks recognizably like a face because of those kind of shared organizational principles. Um, but that organization, um, do I have this? No, I don't, that's okay. Um, averaging in that way glosses over the individual differences that are so important in how we use those faces. And we think that something as similar is happening um, with um, human brain networks. Um, we being the field, again, this isn't, this isn't our work. Um, uh, this is work from Emmanuel and Chuck showing that, you know, that is indeed the case. Um, like this yellow network frontal parietal control is, is uh, present in all individuals in roughly the same places, but you can see that there are big differences um, in, in how those are organized. What, uh, what, what Chuck and Emmanuel showed was that uh, you could um, develop a framework. Um, this is software code, which is freely available. We've shared it online if, if you're interested that simulates um, individual brain responses uh, to stimulation at, uh, at, at a given site. Um, it simulates the electric field response based on both the anatomy um, and the functional topography and tells you which networks are likely to be engaged by stimulating at that site. And it basically then does that thousands of times over different coil locations and orientations um, and allows you to, uh, to identify what is the optimal target site and coil orientation to engage whatever network you want while sparing whatever other networks you might want. And, and this shows you like how important that is. Um, uh, this is a bit of a digression, sorry, but I think it's important. Um, you can see that, uh, that the kind of standard um, MNI guided target for uh, 
left dorsolateral prefrontal TMS engages wildly different networks in these different individuals. If you focus, for example, on the yellow frontal parietal network, which we think might be a target for treatment, um, it ranges from like 5% of what's engaged to like 70% of what's engaged. Um, and uh, the, the, the software platform that Chuck and Emmanuel developed basically can solve that problem. Not perfectly, but it can identify targets that really optimize for one network while sparing others. Um, so, so check out that. But I want to close by, um, by returning this idea of um, changes in, uh, in fMRI measures that, uh, that might explain um, mood state transitions. Um, this work, uh, led by Chuck, also with uh, collaboration from Emmanuel, um, involved a small number of patients who we scan repeatedly. Um, this is really kind of heroic and, and labor-intensive work. Um, they've scanned uh, uh, like eight or so individuals, um, anywhere from 40, 60, up to 80 times over the course of several years as they cycle in and out of different mood states. This shows you um, uh, you know, fluctuations in, um, in, in anhedonic symptoms. There are also interesting fluctuations in other symptoms, of course. This is just sort of orienting you to the kind of rich data that we have. And because we have so much data within an individual, we can uh, embark on kind of a, a, a different kind of analytic paradigm for fMRI data we and others are using in which uh, each individual becomes their own experiment. And we can do like meaningful statistical inference within a single person. Um, and and uh, we don't have to assume that the same mechanisms are involved in all people, but of course it would be interesting to see convergence and divergence across individuals. So what did we find? Um, so we began just by asking whether the organization of those functional networks that I just described is different across, uh, across different um, patients with depression versus uh, healthy control patients. And one finding really stood out dramatically, honestly, much more so than I think uh, any of us expected. And that's that this uh, frontostriatal salience network is uh, dramatically expanded in patients with depression. This uh, is a representation of the neuroanatomical kind of uh, territory occupied by this network in a, in a representative healthy control subject. And this is a example uh, patient with depression. Again, no stats are needed to, to tell that this is much, much larger than this. Um, that's one individual. We see that very consistently across most individuals with depression. This is another way of representing like how commonly um, each area um, is occupied by salience network in depression versus healthy controls. Um, uh, and, and this shows you kind of a distribution of the data across individuals. I'd highlight here that uh, these are really big effect sizes. Um, and we think that's important for a lot of reasons, but just to kind of put it in context, in most of the fMRI work that we and others have done looking at differences in individual connectivity features in depression, effect sizes are on the order of Cohen's D, like 0.15 to 0.25 is a big one. Um, these effect sizes are uh, between one and two. Um, they're really big effects. Um, and uh, that led us to ask whether it might be the case that um, perhaps this network is expanding and contracting as a person gets depressed and not depressed. And uh, the, the data that Chuck collected were kind of ideally su suited to asking that question. And, and again, this is an example of where our hypotheses turn out to be totally wrong. Um, uh, 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 the data were very clear. Um, these are uh, uh, four representative examples um, from a given patient um, to when they were depressed, uh, two, when they're not depressed. Um, and you can see, um, just to really appreciate, the boundaries of that network are like rock solid stable. They, they do not change. Um, and we see that very consistently uh, across individuals. Here's data from other folks. Um, uh, they, they really don't change much um, uh, in, in repeated assessments, despite, despite the fact that their symptoms are changing quite a lot. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have another slide. Um, uh, I'll just tell you about it, um, and then I'll close. Um, interestingly, we found that there were also individual differences um, in uh, the way that expansion occurred. Um, so we looked at um, if one network is expanding, what is contracting? Um, this is a zero-sum game, right, where every, every cortical surface node is assigned to a network. So if something's getting bigger, something else has to be getting smaller. And what was curious to us is that like at the group level, we saw these huge effects for salience network expansion, but really no very clear consistent effects for contraction of, of other networks. And it turned out that that was explained by heterogeneity, um, that there were essentially um, three clusters of patients uh, 
um, who experienced different kinds of contraction encroaching on different networks, most commonly the default mode network, the singular opercular network, or the frontal parietal control network, um, or some combination of those. Um, and uh, we see very clear evidence of contraction of like default mode, for example, within one group, but not another. Um, and we think these individual differences uh, might be uh, quite important. Um, so, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to describe another key finding without a slide, which, which, which I neglected to include, and, and, then, I'll, and then I'll close, close with the last part. Um, uh, that led us to ask whether it might be the case that this network, and, and I bring this up for folks like Myrna might be interested to hear this, um, whether this network might be a marker of, uh, of, of risk for depression, of, of becoming depressed in response to stressful life events. And that's a hard question to tackle. Um, you, you know, you can imagine the ideal kind of data you would want. Um, we did our best um, with uh, data from the um, ABCD data sets um, among uh, like 10,000 kids who were scanned um, from a community sample. We were able to identify 60 who had uh, no depression at ages 10 and 12 and then became depressed at age 14. Um, and uh, and had high quality fMRI data. And what Chuck was able to show was that uh, this network is actually expanded in these kids with who who go on to become depressed before they ever get depressed, suggesting that it might be instead of kind of driving state dependent switches, might be a marker of of risk that's more stable. Um, lastly, I'll close with you know what is responsible for those state dependent switches. Um, we focused uh, on anhedonia. Um, although we have interesting findings from other symptom domains, um, and connectivity between anterior cingulate and nucleus accumbens nodes of the uh, salience network. You recall from the very beginning that I showed you that in the mouse, accumbens projecting anterior cingulate cells seem to be important for encoding a, a signal that integrates information about reward and effort and, and modulates motivation. And so we reasoned that changes in functional connectivity within this circuit um, might uh, explain um, fluctuations over time in anhedonia. And that's indeed what we saw in this one individual. We also saw a very similar uh, correlation, similar effect size in, 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 in other individuals. We also saw this across individuals. So this is looking at how changes in functional connectivity um, correlate with changes in anhedonia within one person. This is looking cross-sectionally at how uh, individual differences in connectivity within this circuit explain individual differences in anhedonia at a given point in time. Um, and then maybe most interestingly, we also found in the longitudinal data that uh, changes in connectivity in this circuit, which by the way, are specific to anhedonia and unrelated to other symptoms, um, are uh, predictive of future anhedonic symptoms. And that's depicted here. Um, this is essentially a uh, cross correlation, looking at the correlation between connectivity and uh, anhedonic symptoms at different lags, minus one being connectivity today predicting anhedonia at the next session. And you can see that the correlation um, for one week in advance is similar actually to the correlation that we get uh, uh, like concurrently, um, suggesting um, like one kind of first step towards establishing a causal relationship here. Um, it's not just that they're correlated with one another, changes in connectivity actually predict future symptoms. Um, and, and so uh, perhaps um, this could be a good target for intervention. And uh, I will stop with that. I just want to highlight the people who did this work, um, in particular, the folks in blue who, who did all the studies, and, and my collaborators, uh, Faith Gunning, Logan Grosnick, Lindsay Victoria, Ben Zebley, uh, and Nolan Williams, um, who, who made a lot of this work possible. Thanks.